Great. Um, good morning, everyone. So, yeah, well, um, talk is about Mendeley and open data. And obviously, there is a, an elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Mendeley, the company that I founded uh, four years ago, earlier this week has been acquired by Elsevier. Uh, one of the things that I read about it on Twitter uh, was someone saying it's like um, Austin Powers teaming up with the Dr. Evil of research. So uh, one of the things we had to do first thing was like to throw out the, the foosball table and beanbags our, uh, of our office uh, and install shark tanks instead. <laughs> and so um, while my colleagues are busy mounting the friggin' lasers on the shark's heads, I've been sent here um, to tell you that if you don't comply with our demands, whatever they may be, we're going to have to blow up the moon and the Welcome Trust. And I'm glad you think I'm joking. <laughs> so, well, anyway, I'm going, to address, um, I'm going to address this later in my presentation. But I want to start off by talking about um, why we started Mendeley in the first place, where we've come from and where we intend to take it in the future. Uh, the starting point for us was a thought that Tim Berners-Lee expressed uh, at a TED talk a while ago. So what he said about open data was, all the time we're very conscious of the huge challenges that human society has now, curing cancer, understanding the brain for Alzheimer's. But a lot of the state of knowledge of the human race is sitting in the scientists' computers and is currently not shared. And we need to get it unlocked so we can tackle those huge problems. And that was what we want to do with Mendeley. It's about getting to the scientists' computers and helping them unlock and share that knowledge. And the reason we, we had this point of view was because we were PhD students when we came up with the idea for Mendeley. We all had hundreds of PDFs sitting on our hard drives and wanted a better way to manage that information and to extract information from those documents. And so we came up with a tool, Mendeley Desktop, which is free. It's cross-platform for Windows, Mac, and Linux. There are mobile apps. You can download it, install it on your computer. You can just point it to the folder where you store all of your PDFs, or you drag and drop a bunch of PDFs into the software. And Mendeley will try to figure out what's the metadata of the document, the author, title, volume, journal, issue, uh, the abstracts, keywords, um, and even the references. And it also indexes the full text to help you uh, find you know, the little bit of text that you remember you read somewhere, but you know, you're not uh, quite sure where. Um, it lets you then organize those papers and highlight and annotate the papers digitally and synchronize that to the cloud and back it up and also read it on your mobile devices. And you can set up collaborative groups to share and discuss research. So you receive a sort of news feed, but unlike Facebook, it's centered around the research activity in your network. The documents that your friends are reading, um, the papers that your collaborators have been adding to your group, the questions and the comments that they may have on the group. And the key idea behind Mendeley is that all of that research activity gets anonymously aggregated in the cloud, and we can then do interesting stuff with that data. So to give you some stats of um, the scale of Mendeley. So uh, since we started uh, a little more than four years ago, we've grown to 2.3 million users. Uh, the 15 largest user bases are um, at some of the leading research institutions in the world. Here, uh, the University of Oxford is our second biggest user base. And we've also built a community uh, of advisors, the Mendeley advisors, who in turn help us set up local communities on campuses around the globe. There are currently about 1,500 of these Mendeley advisors, and they teach classes uh, about how to get the most out of Mendeley. They introduce us to their librarian, um, get the librarian to support Mendeley, and also give us feedback from their campus, what works, what doesn't. Um, they help us test new features, like the recommendation engine. They get early access to that and help us figure out you know, how to improve it. Collectively, these users have uploaded an astonishing amount of information. Actually, this chart is already outdated again because uh, more than 380 million documents have been uploaded to the site. Uh, on any given day, in 24 hours, it's about 600, 650,000 documents. And uh, what makes it unique is that it's not just the metadata, but we always had this idea that we wanted to establish the context around the document. So. Apart from the document metadata, um, we can put it 
in, into like a perspective with the user profiles and demographics of that readership. In which academic field is a paper popular? In which geographic regions? Is it read by undergrads versus PhD students versus professors versus people in industry or doctors or nurses? What are the tags that people put on those documents? What are the notes that they put on documents? What are the parts of the paper that they highlight? Now, mind you, we are not ever making uh, public, we don't make information available that's personally identifiable. So you will never be able to infer what Victor Henning has read this week. But it's more about the aggregate information that reveals global research trends. We can use that data, like Lee has explained, to also generate recommendations based on collaborative filtering. Uh, what have other academics with similar interests to yours, what have they read that you might also be interested in? It's sort of like Amazon's people who have bought these books have also bought those books. Uh, and of course, we can do real-time reading stats, uh, how popular is a paper around the globe. Now, um, what does that data actually look like? And is it you know, representative? What's the coverage? What's the correlation with citation metrics, which, as you know, are the gold standard so far of measuring an academic's impact? Um, there have been, in the last year, a couple of studies looking specifically at Mendeley's data and, and how well it correlates with, say, uh, Google Scholar citations, Scopus citations, or Thomson Reuters Web of Science citations. One of the first ones uh, was this one, published in Scientometrics, called Validating Online Reference Managers for Scholarly Impact Measurement. Uh, the key stats for the study, the sample uh, contained uh, roughly 1,600 articles published in Nature and Science in 2007. Data collection took place in July 2010, uh, when I think our database roughly had uh, probably a seventh or an eighth of the current size, so it was much smaller. And back then, Mendeley already covered roughly 94% uh, of Nature articles and 93% of Science articles. Uh, the correlation tables showed that uh, Mendeley readership statistics, how many people have added documents to their libraries, um, correlates with Web of Science and Google Scholar citations at 0.54 to 0.6. Uh, they did a follow-up study, also involving F1000 data, and we'll hear from F1000 later. Um, this time, uh, the sample was uh, 1,400 articles from 172 different journals, uh, in 2008. Data collection took part in January last year, and this time we covered 99.5% of the articles sampled. Again, correlation statistics um, between 6.68 to 0.69 for the entire sample, or if you just look at the outliers, the very highly cited articles, or the very highly read articles, there the correlation is 0.93 um, for those articles with citation metrics in Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar, so extremely high. Uh, another one, uh, which took a slightly different tack, they only looked at one journal, uh, Jesist, which is the Journal of the American Society for Information Science and Technology. But all of the articles that this journal ever published from 2001 to 2011, data collection took part a year ago. Uh, again, we covered 97% of all articles. And again, uh, very high and, and significant correlations. So this data is actually really useful to predict how citations will develop in the future, because logically, you should be reading an article before you cite it. So coming back to the original vision of sharing and unlocking data, this data that I've described to you, uh, we decided very early on that we wanted to turn this into a platform for others to build applications on top of. So we've made all of this information available under a Creative Commons CC BY license through our API. And to date, uh, more than 300 active third-party apps have been built that pull this data uh, into their respective applications. So I just want to give you a few examples of this. The first one is to extend Mendeley to platforms where we don't have our own apps at the moment. For example, Android. Um, there have been several third-party Android apps uh, have been developed, like Scholarly, Androidly, and there's also an app for the Kindle, if you want to sync your Mendeley library to your Kindle. And um, actually, that's, that's a startup itself. So KinSync um, has a premium service where they allow you to sync all of your documents to the Kindle. 
Another one is sharing the readership statistics with old metrics tools. Uh, I'm pretty sure that old metrics has been yesterday or will be today a, a big discussion topic uh, at this conference as well. Um, so we are sharing our information for free with altmetric.com, which is one of the startups from the digital science slash nature stable, um, who are in turn also a, a for-profit company, which are selling that data on, but we're also sharing it with non-profit initiatives like Impact Story or Reader Meter. Another one is allowing uh, academics to pull their and their network's research activity into any other environment. So this time, Hoyoki, that's a German startup, um, which is trying to build a business around mashing up different online services. So if you want to have a data feed from Dropbox, from Evernote, from Huddle, from Basecamp, from Mendeley, all in a single feed, so you can tailor your you know, interface into the different tools that you use, uh, you can access your Mendeley research activity from within Hoyoki as well. There is a plugin that someone has built for uh, Moodle called Moodley. So you can share Mendeley information uh, to your students in virtual learning environments. Uh, we've had a collaboration funded by JISC together with Symplectic, another company from the Digital Science uh, Nature Group, together with the University of Cambridge, um, which allows you to share Mendeley profile information, publications and usage data with institutional repositories managed by the repository manager of the institution. Conversely, you can also use the API to uh, push information from outside of Mendeley into the network to make it more discoverable. Uh, a great example of that is a French startup, again a for-profit, <coughs> called um, Plasmid.io. So Plasmid.io builds tools to describe plasmids, um, which are kind of uh, uh, descriptions of you know, snippets of, of uh, genes. And so you can create those um, plasmid descriptions on your iPhone, iPad, uh, on your Mac, and you can then hook it up to Mendeley and share it to your Mendeley network. And um, their founder has expl explicitly said the reasoning behind this was that they wanted to tap into the research workflow, you know, where people are managing the documents, and push their information into where people can find it. So those are just a few of the examples that, um, um, you know, how people are using our data and our API. Now, coming back to the elephant in the room that I mentioned earlier, how, or, you know, how, how will things change with the LSV acquisition if they change at all? So first, uh, from the perspective of our users, I'll, I'll talk about the perspective of developers and open API uh, in a minute, but for our users, what it means is that as a startup, especially as a, as a commercial startup as we've been, you always try to balance, and you have to balance, two competing interests. Uh, one is trying to get to break even as quickly as possible so you become independent of further funding rounds. The other one is to actually grow your user base and give your users what they want and give away more value for free. Now, this acquisition actually means that we can take a longer term perspective and we don't have to monetize each new feature that we build. So the first thing that we did was we doubled the free storage space for our users, which was one of the main things that we monetized in the past. Uh, the second main thing that we currently monetize is collaboration. So we have accounts for teams where they can set up uh, working groups for five up to 50 people to share information. Uh, we've already uh, given our Mendeley advisors a free team account, and we are looking into how we can expand collaboration limits for all of our users. Uh, we also now have more resources. Uh, one of the first things that we're doing is we're going to hire a mobile development team, which is what we've wanted to do for a long time but just couldn't afford. Um, so we'll be hiring the mobile development team to finally build an in-house Android app, which is uh, one of the highest requested features by our user base. And <clears throat> personally, for me, I'm still using Mendeley as, you know, I published my last paper as an academic last year and I still use it to keep track of research. One of the biggest frustrations for me and in the user experience was once we helped you discover content through recommendations, through um, the public groups in Mendeley, there was still a break in how you then got to the actual full text. We would use DOIs to send you away to the publisher website and then you'd have to figure out yourself how to get access through, um, you know, 
a sign-on through whipping out your credit card. Um, and we want to make that easier by integrating with Scopus and Cybers and their authentication technologies. Now, what does it mean for developers and the open data community? Uh, one of the things that we already committed to earlier this year and which we'll keep pushing is to move our own tools, Mendeley Desktop, uh, the iOS app, and our website to our open API infrastructure. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to date, we've been using proprietary APIs. So our developers use the different method for communicating with our services than external developers. Um, for a number of reasons, just like homegrown systems, each team had their own way of talking to the server. What we wanted to do is move all of that to the open API, which then means for us it's easier. We only have to maintain one set of APIs. We can test it more regularly. Uh, we are dog fooding the APIs that we give to external developers. So external developers should see a faster, more stable service uh, with more API methods, the same ones that our in-house development team uses. Um, we're also committing to maintain everything under the same CC BY license, so no change there. One of the frequent complaints that developers had about our data was that because it was crowdsourced, it was a bit messy. So sometimes there was information missing, there were duplicates. Uh, now what we can do and what we intend to do over the next few months is use the clean and structured data that Scopus and Science Direct provide to clean up our own data and enrich it. Um, you know, fill in missing DOIs, filling missing abstracts, um, possibly add in additional information like citation data, which we didn't track before. Uh, also, uh, Elsevier and Scopus have uh, created 17 million author profiles based on citation analysis. And what we'll be aiming to do is pull that into Mendeley to allow our users to claim those citations and easily add them to their profiles. Um, and we're also looking how we can make that available through the API for external developers. So again, this means better data, a better service for, for our developers. And uh, we also have a number of research projects, uh, grant funded through JISC, through um, the European Union, with several different research universities. And what we want to do is continue those research projects and expand on them. Uh, those research projects currently uh, cover metadata extraction, recommendation engines, semantic analysis, user-generated semantic markup, uh, text mining, and we will gradually Im introduce these new methods into the API uh, when they're production ready. So again, tools that we've built for our own use, but we will also make them available for third-party developers. And in a nutshell, I think that's what we want to accomplish uh, with, this, with this new uh, partnership. Thank you. <clears throat>